My name is Callum Carmichael. I'm on faculty at the School of Public Policy and Administration at Carleton University and the supervisor of its graduate programs in philanthropy and nonprofit leadership. What, okay, what a delight to be in Vancouver, really. Uh, to have spent yesterday afternoon in brilliant sunshine walking to English Bay. I, I, uh, I now know why all my BC friends in Ottawa are homesick. But, uh, okay, in a small way, I'm very glad it's raining today because then I can say the Central Canadian consolation mantra, you wouldn't want to move to British Columbia because the winters are so dreary. <laughs> Frankly, I think that is a rumor created by Vancouverites to prevent <laughs> Central Canadians from invading. But uh, what a wonderful place to be and what a wonderful place to feel so welcomed. At the outset, I'd like to acknowledge that the very beautiful land on which we gather is the traditional and unceded territory of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh peoples. Now, when, when we acknowledge the land, whether the Anishinaabe in Ottawa or as here, it reminds me that although, although we inherit a certain history from our ancestors, we have the opportunity, or, our, or rather, we have the challenge and responsibility to leave a better history for our descendants. Sure enough, this is a challenge. But for me, the idea of creating and leaving a better history is also a source of great hope, whether for reconciliation or whether for other unfinished business. Hope because we have witnessed some histories being changed, being changed for good. Let me give you an example. What a different history was left by the group of citizens in Ottawa who took it upon themselves 80 years ago to organize and deliver university level night classes to student populations otherwise underserved. Uh, people with families, uh, people who were working during the day, people who were returning from the war effort, providing them with a chance to invest in themselves and their futures. What a different history that community group left for the 170 alumni and alumni of Carleton University, some of whom are with us today. And I must admit, let me be even more self-referential, how about that with a 14-point deficit after halftime to go back and win the 15th championship out of 19 years? There you go, but I digress. More immediately, what a different history is now being left by Susan Phillips and other faculty members at the School of Public Policy and Administration who 10 years ago recognized that Canada had very few graduate programs focused on attracting and preparing people for careers of contribution through the philanthropic and nonprofit sector. Seeing a nationwide need for such a program, they had the audacity to design and mount a program that could be delivered nationwide one that would reach people regardless of where they lived in Canada, whether they were working or whether they were fresh out of university. Providing that program by first of all, bringing these people together from across Canada, about 25 to 30 of them, bringing them together as a cohort twice for a two week intensive session at the beginning of the program for another two week intensive session near the end of the program and then providing the rest of the program online so they could stay where they lived, continue to work where they were working. Carleton's Master of Philanthropy and Nonprofit Leadership is now entering its eighth year and has more than 155 alumni, alumni working in or with the sector throughout Canada and wonderful to see them here tonight, some of them who are now working in the Vancouver area. And wonderful to anticipate more coming from BC. Let me give you an example. Uh, Amanda Preston from Langley, a social worker who eight years ago created her own national charity to support adoptive and foster parents. Through this charity, she seeks to attract and retain such parents by improving the collaboration between them and the social welfare system. She will be among the 25 that will be entering our program this year from across Canada, joined, I hope, by uh, the university athlete from uh, Alberta who wants to start a charity on avoiding bullying in sports, to the executive from the finance sector who has now moved to a prairie city to head the United Way there, to the former ballet dancer who's now working with street youth in Winnipeg. 
they've all seen that this is an opportunity for them to join others who see their contribution through the sector, see it differently. But the fact that they come from across Canada is such a gift, and the fact that they meet each other face by face before learning online. It's because now we are a maturing national program serving a national student population that we have started a national tour to consult representatives of the communities, of businesses, governments, the nonprofit sector, all engaged in philanthropy. Vancouver is our first stop. And we do this thanks to the amazing support of donors, thanks to philanthropy, who share our vision that we can strengthen Canada's philanthropic and nonprofit sector by attracting and strengthening the skills, industry, the cohesiveness of the men and women working in it. I thank those sponsors, and specifically with tonight's lecture, I am most grateful to the support that our program, that our students receive from TD Bank. But let me return to our challenge of changing and improving history, the history we inherit. Philanthropy is a personal or collective way for individuals and corporations to do just that. But are there ways in which philanthropy can be more effective, can bring about bigger change, better change, more enduring change? And if we can identify those ways, how can we muster and sustain the resolve to act on them? What will allow philanthropy to have greater impact? These are the types of questions we'll be looking at tonight. Now, up until two days ago, Jim Ferris, the director of the Center of Philanthropy and Public Policy at the University of Southern California, would be our headline act. He would start off the evening and deliver a short lecture to which our panel of practitioners would respond. However, Jim's university, and indeed most universities in the United States, are now prohibiting or restricting international travel. And so, Jim is not able to speak with us tonight. Now, at the risk of encouraging you to ask for your money back, I'm taking on the role of delivering the TD lecture, laying out ways in which I see the academic literature trying to answer that question of how can we make philanthropy have greater impact. Now, in delivering this lecture, let me say it's more like an un-lecture, and let me explain that. I'm not taking on the role of being a sage on the stage. Hard though that might be for someone like me, raised in rural southwestern Ontario, whose primary education was in, yes, was in a two-room schoolhouse, whose family was one of five on a party line. Do you even know what a party line is? I, I'm not retro, I'm vintage. And for me, to be a teacher meant that your role was to know everything that had to be learned. I've had to shake out of that role because that is a burden for any teacher to think you are the vessel of wisdom. And I'm not. And, and this was something that was really helped by joining the School of Public Policy and Administration, where the goal of the research and the teaching is to improve professional practice and public policy. And certainly the knowledge needed to do that has to come from the grassroots. Academics have a role to play, but they need to speak to the people who are dealing with the policies, dealing with the issues, dealing with the instruments of government that are that, able to judge what interventions are going to be successful, which ones are not. And so I was recultured in the school to be aware that information from the actual sector that you're dealing with is very important. So really, what I'm going to be doing is presenting more questions from the academic literature than really answers. And let's look at that then. The academic literature, I would say, provides four general approaches to understanding what would give philanthropy greater impact. Those are to uh, uh, increase the amount of philanthropy, alter the destination of philanthropy, bring more analysis and managerial skills to, to the work of charities and foundations, or to widen the par partnerships of the philanthropic sector within that sector itself and with government and business, and to be more inclusive to represent the societies that they serve. Those are the three avenues, and those are the ones we're going to look at in turn. Okay, well, let's look at the first one. It's a matter of quantity, increasing the numbers of donors and the amounts they give. That's the way to get greater impact. Well, typically at this point, the, the literature would talk about problems in Canada, 
problems in Canada that would focus now on the numbers of donors and, and the amounts that they're giving. And here what I've got is um, indicating the number of tax filers who actually claim charitable deductions in Canada. As you can see, the, uh, the donors are that downward slope going down to your right, fewer donors amongst tax filers, and you can see creeping up there are the total don donations that they've made. Now, what I've done is I've inserted the, um, the uh, inflation-adjusted amounts of donations that are growing actually rather slowly since uh, over the last 20 years. Now, sure enough, fewer are giving more, but, but it means that there are now fewer, more concentrated donors, donors who tend to be the most affluent. It becomes now really, don philanthropy is becoming a rich person's sport, not a community activity. So it is morphing in that, and, and there's a concern that now Canadians are not only uh, fewer giving, but they're giving less. Uh, now it is about uh, one out of every um, um, five tax filers who claim charitable donations. It's one out of every three in the United States and one out of every three in Australia. So relative to those other countries, there are fewer donors who are amongst the tax filers. One third of tax filers with incomes over $350,000 claim no charitable gift. One quarter of those with income greater than a million dollars claim no charitable gift. What, what, what is going on? What is going on as well when we look at millennials and Gen X? Now here, this is hard to follow, but, but what I'm doing is comparing 1997, uh, roughly 20 years ago, think of Candle in the Wind, Elton John. Okay, Prince has died, has died. Um, and think of, I'll be missing you, who sang that? But anyway, that, that's where we are, boom, boomers out there. You can see, there you are. Uh, at that time, you would have been between 35 and 54 years of age. Almost 12% of the tax filers in that bracket then, uh, of the boomers, were, um, were then um, uh, donating. And now if we look 20 years later, Gen X, it's only 7%. Okay? If we look at the percentage of tax filers over um, 50 years that are donating, if there you can see it goes up because, uh, in 2017 because the boomers have entered that category. Look, though, at the lagging, uh, though, of, of the millennials. They're in the gray. In 2017, only uh, fewer than uh, three would be donating, whereas um, more of that in, in amongst the Gen X. So what we're seeing is that as, as cohorts um, are coming forward, the norm of, of charitable giving is becoming rarer. So it's a concern that if we're already at a low level, where are we going from here? The next approach is thinking about destination, directing more donations to the purposes and organizations that deal with the most pressing problems, that, that the organizations that can be most effective and efficient. So here again, I'm not saying this is what I believe, it's just this is in the literature. Uh, some are claiming if you want impact, then you should be giving to those, those purposes that are going to make a difference for the people in greatest needs. And this is associated with the movement of effective um, uh, 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 altruism, uh, the work of, of uh, philosophers Peter Singer and William McGaskill, and it's inspired groups and organizations that also are, are in Canada. Uh, Effective Altruism Toronto is a group of like-minded people that are focusing on certain sectors that are seen to be the most uh, important. Uh, RC Forward is Reconsider Charity Forward. They had a pilot project in Canada last year, 2019, to encourage people to use their giving platform where they select those purposes that are the most potent in global health, human empowerment, and, and animal welfare, essentially dealing with health, of the most impoverished, um, looking at, at education for those in greatest need, and also relieving suffering, whether it's human or, or, or um, uh, other sentient beings. So here they have selected where the impact will be greatest. Or again, uh, Charity Intelligence Canada also recommends charities that have the greatest impact. Um, it seems though that, that most donors, they might give lip service to impact, uh, fundraisers may, may, may promise to offer it, but most donors don't really take it into account. What's most important for them is, is to look at affiliations, 
uh, connections, loyalty to certain organizations. And if we look then at, at the donations across uh, different causes, um, we see that, that most are going actually to causes that serve the types of populations from which the donors come, um, education or health or religious organizations. Not that a minority is being given to people in abject need. So here, if we see that those in, in, in people living in low income are the ones or, um, of greatest need, they're not the ones where the bulk of philanthropy is going. So here, should we do something, should governments do something to encourage greater giving to pr privileged sectors? Well, is that what philanthropy is all about? Uh, what if part of it is allowing people to express what is important to them? You might just destroy a giving culture if you try to control it. And so there's a counter movement against this, certainly uh, represented by donor-centered fundraising, that really think that in order to encourage philanthropy, you have to make sure the donor has a say in what is important to them and where they give, regardless of where they give. So there's obviously a debate there. How else can philanthropy have a greater impact? Well, this is another area of analysis and management that really has had a resurgence. Uh, sure enough, the idea of treating symptoms rather than causes, um, no, treating causes rather than symptoms is, is, is an age old um, uh, idea. It's, it's uh, certainly going back hundreds of years, but now it is, is uh, receiving a different focus, particularly the past 20 years by so-called strategic philanthropy. The idea is that foundations and charities should be business-like and result-driven. They set priorities, focus on measurable goals, develop, develop evidence-based means for achieving them, support capacity-ready grantees as winners, measure progress, correct uh, their, their, their course as needed, evaluate, learn from that experience. They are to become more business-like in the acumen they bring to charity. This would require charities really to scale up to have the resources to hire specialized personnel to acquire the abilities of management evaluation in order to, to, to be more effective. They need to pay higher salaries, deny the overhead myth, and, and then to, to be more serious and, and bring managerial acumen to the task of, of, of philanthropic uh, donation. What is now more current is also the idea that there are all sorts of data that are being generated that could equip the charitable and, and, and philanthropic sector, the nonprofit sector, to be able to raise more funds, to find areas of intervention that are going to be the most potent. And so now a whole level of data analytics is really required by the sector and more data need to be generated that are more reliable uh, and that are going to be able to equip the sector to make better decisions. Finally, the third or the fourth line of argument is that charities and foundations need to shift power. They need to collaborate, collaborate with governments, collaborate with the communities that they are to serve, and to include people from society so that the composition of the people within foundations and charities resemble the diversity of the societies that they are addressing. Here, the resources of the philanthropic sector are seen to be inadequate. Uh, to address the enormity of social problems. Therefore, they need to leverage the, the greater funding from government. They need to leverage the business smarts of, of the corporate sector. And they themselves can serve as this connector to the communities of which they have some representative um, uh, claim. And here as well, there is a sense that there needs to be greater engagement with the communities themselves. Seeing them not as, uh, as, as uh, a source of problems, communities are not something that needs to be fixed from the outside, but rather recognizing within communities the assets they have, the grassroots knowledge they have, and engage with the communities to bring that knowledge into the decisions of how to intervene and where. No uh, other community, I suggest, requires such engagement than the indigenous community. Certainly the case for collaboration and engagement is strong in the context of reconciliation, as formally recognized by the 79 foundation and nonprofit leaders who have signed the philanthropic community's call to action. We'll see if, if that has staying power. 
And finally, it's the inclusion so that the actual sector looks like the population they serve. And toward this end, um, there has been considerable work done by the Philanthropic Foundations of Canada looking at the representation of women, looking at the representation of, of um, racialized people within the sector, uh, and, and hoping that the sector would look more like the society that they are, are serving. Uh, the results, though, suggest that, um, that many of the board members look a lot like me. Okay. Um, old, male, ramble on about party lines. They, they're the type of people, and in fact, one of the, a woman who came works for a progressive foundation, really. She came and spoke to the class last year, and um, she said, as an indigenous woman, I walked into the boardroom, and I looked around at the pictures on the walls, and I said to myself, do I belong here? Well, I'm so grateful she has stuck it out. She does belong. The organization needs her. And if there are barriers, however unintentional, if there are barriers, what does that say about the sector and its capacity to understand the people it wants to serve? Well, there you have it. There you have it. Um, here, the, the literature provides four answers. It's a matter of amount, destination, analysis and management, partnership and inclusion. But I'd rather say the academic literature, here I'm not the sage on the stage. I think the academic literature poses questions, not answers. And to help us understand that, is it a matter of amount? Is it a matter of destination? Is it a matter of greater analysis and management? Is it a matter of partnership and inclusion? These are these are not necessarily mutually exclusive avenues to go down, but they're not necessarily co uh, coherent, mutually reinforcing. We need to choose across them. And how to see where are the ways in which the sector can reconceive its purpose, reconceive the way it approaches addressing social problems. We can't simply look at academics for answers. We need to look at the sector itself. We need to engage the sector itself. And it's for this reason I am so grateful now to only be an opening act and so that we can now hear from a panel of practitioners and we can hear from you, the practitioners among you, as to what resonates, what will give the sector vitality, creativity, and, and what will allow greater impact and be able to make change, to change history, to change history in positive ways. So to introduce us to those who will guide us through such questions, I am so honored to, uh, to be able to welcome a Carlton alum and a stalwart supporter of the philanthropy and nonprofit leadership program, uh, the chair of our advisory council, Keith Shogren. Keith, thank you for helping us be here tonight. Thank you for being here tonight with us. And I invite you now to, as the chair of our advisory council, to introduce our panel who will now provide their insights on what will be able to give philanthropy greater impact. Keith. Thank you, Callum, for the unlecture. Um, it was extremely interesting and very valuable. As Callum uh, indicated, we're delighted to be in Vancouver. Uh, Vancouver, home to uh, a number of Carlton graduates, and, uh, and including those that uh, um, have joined the program uh, that we represent today. Over the, the past seven years, the, the Master of Philanthropy and Nonprofit Leadership at Carlton has had an advisory council in place, and the advisory council provides input into the program, we link the program um, uh, to the charitable sector in, in a number of ways, and uh, we play the role of awareness ambassadors uh, at every opportunity. Uh, for this program, which is national and specifically designed uh, for those who wish to assume uh, leadership positions in the sector in the future. Uh, the Advisory Council is made up of eight people, uh, members of the council include leaders of foundations, active philanthropists, researchers, fundraising consultants, and educators. And indeed, one of our members, Hillary Pearson, is co-chair of the federal government's advisory committee on the charitable sector. 
And this evening, uh, it's my privilege to introduce the members of the panel uh, and our moderator, who appropriately is both a member of the Advisory Council um, and the TD Executive with responsibility for the TD's Private Giving Foundation. So responding to Callum's remarks will be uh, four highly qualified panelists. Kevin McCourt, uh, who probably doesn't need any introduction in Vancouver, President Chief Executive Officer of the Foundation, the Vancouver Foundation, a member of our advisory council, and also a member of the government's uh, ad advisory committee on the charitable sector. Next to Kevin is Jennifer Connolly, the Chief Advancement Officer and Community Liaison Officer at Carleton University, and I should add a graduate of the program, and more recently, an instructor in the program. Next to Jennifer is Farhad Ahmed, Chair of the Board of Thousand Currents, an Oakland, California-based charity focused on funding grassroots groups and movements in the Global South. And Farhad uh, is pursuing a PhD in public policy at Carlton. And on my far left is Chris Archie, the Executive Director of the Circle on Philanthropy and Aboriginal Peoples in Canada, an Ottawa-based organization that undertakes critical work in linking Aboriginal communities with government, for-profit, and non-profit institutions. Um, their biographies are included in the material that has been distributed. And as I indicated, our panel moderator this evening is Joanne Ryan, a tireless member of the Advisory Council, a TD executive, and a recognized expert on donor-advised funds and the equally important topic of women and philanthropy. So without further ado, I will ask Joanne to, uh, uh, to undertake the task of facilitating this prestigious panel. Um, and so Joanne, over to you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Keith. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. And um, I want to welcome everybody. Uh, we have an esteemed panel, so it's my honor to, uh, to moderate the panel. And uh, I'm going to start with Kevin. And uh, I think most people know what a community foundation does. Uh, but could you maybe just start by explaining what the Vancouver Foundation does? And, and how does it go about identifying the most pressing needs of the community? Great, thank you. Um, it's suitable that we're in the Alice Mackay room at the Vancouver Public Library. Alice Mackay was a secretary in Vancouver in the 1940s, and when she died, she left a $1,000 gift in her will that was to be endowed, and the income off that was to be used to support women in poverty. And that was the creation story of Vancouver Foundation. We were created by the act of a single person who, created, who, who left a, gil, a, a gift in her estate. But there wasn't a foundation then, so a number of families in Vancouver, 10 families, banded together, and each put in $10,000, and so the foundation was created with $101,000 to honor the gift of Alice Mackay. So we've been around for over 75 years and continue to build this fund. There's now over 2,000 funds have been created by British Columbians. The investments carry on, we grant to charities. We granted close to $70 million last year to charities in the province. And we, um, I like to say that the foundation, as a community foundation, has three elements that make it distinct. The resources we have come from community. British Columbians have given us this money. The ideas that we respond to come from community. We ask charities in the province to identify pressing social, environmental, cultural, uh, economic issues and they identify, they tell us what needs to be resolved. And then the decisions, we have panels of community experts who review those proposals and recommend to our board what we fund. So the resources, the projects, and the ideas that we respond to come from community. And that's uh, really the, the, the key distinctive factor around a community foundation is our origin story and the way that we function on a day-to-day -day basis. And what if a donor wants to support other causes, some that maybe you haven't identified or aren't as urgent? Can they do that? Yeah, and that's a, a key part of, uh, even in Alice's case, she wanted to support women in poverty, and so the fund was set up, and, the, and it's obligation on us to find good uses of that fund. So donor-advised funds, specific purposes, can certainly be established through community foundations. So you're like a matchmaker. 
um, matchmaking yeah. donors to find charities? Yeah, often that's the case. We really uh, try and, and work to build up a good knowledge of what's happening in community so that when donors have specific ideas, we can help guide them to a place or an organization that will do great things with those monies. And do a lot of donors know exactly what they want to support or is there a whole education process that you go through? Uh, we have everything. We have people who know exactly what they want to fund. They've got charities that they've been supporting throughout their lives and they want to leave an enduring legacy. We have others who perhaps have sold a company or inherited money and it's the first time that they've actually thought about philanthropy and they come to us and look for some guidance. So we, we, do, we see the whole range. Great. Okay. And actually two-thirds of high net worth clients in Canada today are self-paid. So they haven't come from generations uh, that have taught them philanthropy. So I think there's a great opportunity there. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to move to Jennifer. Uh, Carlton has recently come out of a very successful campaign. Congratulations. Um, how much did you raise and how did you do it? Well, we did it with donors. So the congratulations actually goes to 29,000 donors who made the largest campaign in Carleton and Ottawa's history possible. So I think that's important to note. Um, there's no research really to support the transformational hero in fundraising. So it's a collective win um, for donors. What we really did through this campaign is we totally transformed the value proposition. So we put our case for support into one inspiring statement, which is we're here for good. We're here for the social, economic, and common good of society. So it's not about the university as a destination. Donors actually give through Carleton to affect positive change in the world. And I have to say this, this really changed everything. It changed the conversation and brought the conversation back to what problems do you see? What challenges do you want to co-create with Carleton University? So I'd say it was donors inspired by something different, a different call to action to just essentially do good. And do good as they saw that they wished to co-create with the university through teaching and learning and research. Did you have some donors um, that were not alumni from Carleton? Actually, our largest donors to the campaign were not alumni. These were individuals who saw a problem in the world and wanted to help solve it. So uh, individual, the largest gift that we received in the campaign was from an individual who wanted to improve the political process and saw Carleton with our deep roots in policy and public affairs as a means to which public policy could change. Great. And did you demonstrate how you're going to measure impact through the campaign? How did that come up? Or Mm -hmm. it's, it's a big buzzword, as you can see, impact. The theme of the day has been impact. So I won't go into all the metrics of evaluation of impact. Um, and we can get into different impacts that we measure by. But I will, I'd like to just be a little provocative about impact and open up the conversation about administrative costs and costs per dollar raised. I see some heads nodding. Thank you for that. Um, so we're pretty agreed as a group, as fundraisers, as professionals, that admin fees, low admin fees, are not a means by which we should measure impact. In other words, that charity spends 11 cents on admin. That charity spends 20 cents. Clearly, lower cost means more impact. So I'll just say, <laughs> to open up that conversation, that's not the case. And admin fees are not a barometer for negative or positive impact, in my opinion. Uh, well said, and I, I totally agree. I have lots of conversations with very intelligent people who want all of their donation to go to a project and not to salaries or admin. But I mean, I, you know, the charity needs money to hire good people. They need human resources departments. Uh, they need computers that work, and all of those things cost money. So uh, it's important. Um, can I have a further retort, Joanne? <laughs> you can say no. We both have dueling microphones. But I also think that the talk about admin fees, so Dan Pallotta's book, Uncharitable, we talk a lot about that as fundraisers. If you don't know of it, um, perhaps look it up. It talks about 
not measuring impact by admin fees, meaning lower or higher. But at the same time, I think charities are tasked and challenged with being as effective and efficient as possible. So to keep costs reasonable, I think, is a challenge, but also a mandate for us as guardians of the public trust. So it's not as though we, can't, we disregard costs and admin fees at all, right. but that we have a reasonable ratio. Right, great. Well, thank you. Um, Fahad, you've been working in the charitable sector for 15 years. You're chair of Thousand Currents, a public foundation. Could you tell me what kind of work they do and, and uh, what your thoughts are regarding how we can have greater impact in the charitable sector? Uh, yes, <clears throat> thank you. Um, and uh, you know, it's my privilege to be on this panel surrounded by such uh, esteemed uh, colleagues uh, speaking on this important issue. Uh, as, uh, as Keith said in the introduction, uh, I, uh, represent, I'm representing here today as the board chair of Thousand Currents, which is a US-based public foundation that supports social movements and grassroots organizations uh, that are led by indigenous people and women and youth in the global south. And the work that we support uh, addresses the important but intersectional issues of climate justice, food sovereignty on alternative economies. And our role as a public foundation, Thousand Currents, is to really enable the work of our grassroots partners and connect them with other movement actors, either regionally or internationally, and as well to donors and funders in the global north. Uh, so there are three elements that inform our work that I also think uh, inform uh, the way uh, I believe we should be thinking about philanthropy in general. The first is that uh, we believe in a relational approach to philanthropy, which is that we want to have deep and authentic relationships with our grassroots partners as well as our funding partners. So with our grassroots partners, that translates to us recognizing that they have the local knowledge and the traditional and indigenous wisdom to understand the need of their communities. So our approach is to give them money and get out of the way, essentially. right? And with, with our funding partners, uh, too, it's about helping them appreciate the complex and interconnected world, shared world that we live in, uh, to help them think about, for example, the origins of wealth accumulation in the global north, but also to help them realize the power that they have in order to affect social change. Uh, the second element that informs our work uh, has to do uh, with an assumption that individuals make up organizations and individuals enable change. So the way that is reflected in our organization in Thousand Currents is that our leadership, our decision makers, reflects the communities that we serve. Since 2010, our executive directors have been women of color. Our board essentially uh, represents the diversity of the communities that we end up funding. Uh, and as well, our, our project, our d program directors are also uh, from the respective re regions that we end up uh, supporting grassroots organizations from. Uh, finally, uh, you know, the, the other philosophy in our work is that the quality of giving is almost as important as the quantity of giving. So what that, what that means is that, you know, when we think about words like innovation or words like uh, alternative ways of approaching philanthropy, we, we take guidance from our grassroots partners. So innovation uh, has to be thought of, for example, as long-term impact, perhaps. Uh, evaluation has to be looked at as a mutual accountability, not just as top-down. Uh, and essentially, we're committed to the principles of social justice philanthropy. Uh, and, uh, and yeah, I'll stop there. So you don't go in and tell organizations what they need to do to fix themselves is what you're saying? Yeah, I mean, I hope not. <laughs> okay, so you're giving... I hope, I hope people generally understand why yeah, that's a bad yeah. idea. <laughs> so you're, you're giving them the power to do uh, what they need to do to, to improve their lives. Okay, great, thank you. And Chris, uh, can you tell us, because I'm not sure if everybody here knows, uh, what the Circle on Philanthropy and Aboriginal Peoples in Canada does? Great, thank you. Is this on? It's like nice and quiet. My voice doesn't typically sound so nice to my own ears. 
Um, so the Circle on Philanthropy, which is a really long name, I talk about my organization as the Circle, uh, is a national member-based organization. So we're legally kind of based out of Ottawa. I live here um, in the Lower Mainland in New Westminster, uh, and I have another staffer who is in Ottawa. Um, we're a member-based organization spanning Canada, and we focus on two primary member audiences. And the first would be what we call the philanthropic sector, um, and the second are Indigenous charitable organizations or qualified donees and Indigenous community-led um, programs and projects. Uh, our work is really in the space of developing relational and technical skill building um, opportunities and experiences for our member audiences. So, for example, with one of our uh, segmented members, what we call the settler created philanthropic sector, we do a lot of work to support their thinking and doing differently as it relates to policy and practice. For example, we had a conversation earlier today around a table and someone said, man, you know, we just get so many requests for grants and then we have to do all the work of looking through all the grants and then make a decision. And I said, so who makes those rules? You know, what are the orthodoxies that we have about how we serve or how we do our philanthropy and who can change those rules? It was like, oh, we can. We're the, we're the rule makers and we can change how it is that we're doing this work. Um, so we support relational and technical skill building for these two member audiences. On the side of supporting Indigenous-led charitable organizations, it's making sure that they're aware of qualified donee status, how to maintain their CRA, um, as well help them understand how they truly do have the solutions for the biggest social problems that this country faces. And they actually are in a position of power for ensuring that they can create the quality of change that really serves many more people um, than just their own communities. A lot of our work is in convening. Uh, a lot of our work is supporting folks to think and do differently, not only in practice and policy, but also in terms of investing in people and investing in place, making sure that organizations in the philanthropic sector are aware of um, their origin stories around their wealth creation, um, making sure that they're thinking wisely about what their community um, wants and needs, and ensuring that when they talk about community, they're not talking only about donors, but they're talking about the people who they're there to serve. Uh, and that typically isn't the high dollar donor that's walking through their door. And how long have, have you existed? The circle has been around for over 10 years. It's actually um, was created by a community of philanthropic folks um, in the East who were, you know, looking around and recognizing that indigenous communities were facing a large number of social and economic ills and thought, mm, there's got to be something done here. Um, and so a community of folks got together and started to meet and developed a network of folks in the philanthropic sector who said, we want to think about how to fund and support indigenous communities differently. They undertook some research, um, and so, you know, earlier today there was a reference um, to the research by Canada Helps about 1% of giving goes to Indigenous charitable organizations. I would just like to point out that, in fact, the Circle on Philanthropy did the first data scrape um, well ahead of the Canada Helps one that recognized that that is, in fact, true. Uh, but our second level of research recognized that when we talk about indigenous organizations, there's still a predominance of dollars going to what we call now indigenous benefiting organizations. So larger organizations who had indigenous people who were um, receiving their services. Uh, our second level of research recognized that there is a difference and a very important difference between indigenous led charitable organizations, uh, indigenous informed charitable organizations and those that have indigenous beneficiaries. Our work really at the end of the day is making sure that more dollars go to indigenous led organizations rather than indigenous beneficiary organizations. Um, indigenous communities have the solutions for the problems that they face uh, and they need to be supported to activate on those solutions. Great, so similar message uh, as Fahad in terms of who you wanna support. Um, so thank you. I'm gonna move back, uh, back to Kevin. Uh, so the Vancouver Foundation is uh, primarily building an endowment. Are you one of the largest uh, community foundations in Canada? Yes. Yes. What size? Mm -hmm. uh, about 1.3 billion, but I like to say we all want to be known for what we do, not for what we have. Okay. Okay. So endowment funds are invested and the earnings are used to grant to the community. Uh, some might argue that some of that capital should be used to solve immediate social problems. So how do you balance investing for the long term versus funding immediate needs in the short term? 
And is there a way to use some of that capital invested for social good? It's a very topical question, and I, I mentioned it was 1.3. That was last week. Uh, it's uh, not as much today. Um, but it'll come back. Uh, but it's a very topical question that people would often look at at Vancouver Foundation with an endowment that we've built over 75 years that is dispersing about 5% of its value on an annual basis and wonder, well, couldn't you do more? Why don't you distribute 10 or 15 or 20 or 50%? And uh, very valid questions because there's no question that the philanthropic sector needs more money. Uh, whether it's from donors, whether it's from governments, whether it's from foundations, there's no question in my mind that the sector needs more money. But we also, um, and so in the universe of, of ways that you fund foundations, the, the community foundation views itself as essentially the savings account for the sector. That it's important that, uh, that you support a sector that really raises money, spends money, but it has to have assets that it can use um, in times of, of turmoil and times of stress. So we view ourselves partly as the saving account for the for the community sector. And so we're, we make arguments about why endowments should exist. They, they exist so that we can fund even perhaps when other sources stop. Now the question then is, well, okay, that's fine. If we give, accept the argument that you need an endowment that you shouldn't spend it down to zero, then how can you invest the money instead of in the broad public markets, can you invest it in ways that also have a social impact? And that is, a, that is one of the current challenges, is trying to reconcile the ability to invest and earn a return to fund your giving program versus investing in other ways that may have more social impact and financial impact. So we're trying to balance those. One of the um, trade-offs uh, is one of the trade-offs. We have to try and bridge that is our endowment and all of our managers who manage the money on our behalf are um, signed up to principles of ESG, environmental and social governance principles, or are also signatures to the UN principles of responsible investing. So the endowment managers themselves are increasingly socially responsible, a big shift in the last five years. We also have another endowment fund, which is a fossil free fund, which is even more um, centered on impact and our board recently has uh, authorized us to do the research on creating an impact first fund. So we're, we're trying to move the, the impact orientation of the endowment closer to our purpose. Mm -hmm. But it is, uh, we still have to generate money because the charities we fund uh, want us to be able to issue a check every quarter. So we keep hearing about social impact investing where you're getting a social and or environmental and a financial rate of return, which would actually put the, make the capital work harder uh, for public good. Are, are you looking at that? We are, but our view on that is that market is actually very small compared to the amount of investable assets that many private foundations have. So we are looking right now at a couple of impact investment funds. They're looking to collect between 15 and $20 million dollars they are relatively high cost and relatively low return compared to what we can do in the financial market. So they exist and they have a role within the universe of things that you fund. But if we were to put the endowment in that space, first, it's, we're too big for those funds. Mm -hmm. we, would, we would own the whole fund and no investor wants to own the whole fund. We would not actually have as much money to distribute to the charities on the other side. So we're really trying to find that right balance. And it's for, for large investors, the impact market is still too small. Uh, there's many for smaller investments. The impact market is actually quite it gives a lot of opportunity, but uh, we're still as a big investor. Uh, it doesn't quite suit our needs yet. Okay, thank you, um, Jennifer. We heard uh, and we've seen in the slides that uh, there's a worry that uh, donors are getting older. Uh, who are responsible for making majority of the donations, um, that younger people are not necessarily replacing them as philanthropists. Um, so in your campaign, well, what did you do and what does Carleton do to engage the younger generation? So um, Carleton was the first university that actually created a crowdfunding site for fundraising. So instead of saying, oh boy, you know, millennials, they're not giving, but they're going on Indiegogo or they're doing these small campaigns, Carlton said, why don't we do that? <laughs> why don't we not complain about it? And why don't we meet them where they are and how they give and how they participate and how they animate? So the Future Funder was born of this problem and of this need to engage. Uh, digital natives in the fundraising process. So what we actually did with the campaign is we migrated the entire campaign online to Future Funder. So you could give digitally, 
you could actually become a champion of your own campaign and get your folks, get your followers, get your influencers to support your campaign. So again, we gave younger people, middle-aged people, older people, the opportunity to lead their own campaigns, their micro campaigns digitally. So that's one of the most important and significant things that we have done in terms of engaging in a different way I mean, fundraising is so disrupted. I don't even know what traditional fundraising is anymore, um, but that's one of the ways that we've been progressive. We also offer text to give and we've started a student philanthropy association, which is exposing our students to philanthropy as a, yes, as a profession, because we're having a hard time recruiting people to the profession and also to bring them into the world of philanthropy and getting involved with causes in a real way. Not necessarily by giving, but by championing and by volunteering. So we are trying to change the conversation about the decline in giving by engaging folks where they're at and where they're comfortable. And we're trying to also grow donors for the future in the way that they want to be grown and listening to them and their needs. So they don't want to go to a charity gala like their parents and go out at 6 p.m. all dressed up. Um, they're looking for uh, different ways. But you think there's hope for millennials? I wouldn't be in fundraising if I didn't believe in hope. <laughs> you, you have to be a hopeful, optimistic person to be in this profession. Um, and I do think it's a more encouraging position in the, in the profession to be hopeful because we have causes that still need support. So for us to be saying millennials aren't giving and looking at the stats, I appreciate the research, I understand the stats, but I have to believe that if we are smarter and work harder and pivot and listen, we will have solutions to these demographic push. Great, and it's important because um, we talk about the intergenerational wealth transfer all the time. We talk about it in our business. And I think if you wait for them to inherit money to start paying attention, it's way too late. There's also so. no guarantee when they inherit that money that it's going to go to philanthropy. Yeah, absolutely. Great, thank you. Um, Fahad, uh, when we spoke earlier, you were concerned about the power dynamic, specifically for those who have a lot of wealth. Um, does philanthropy compromise democracy? And what are your thoughts on the giving pledge is there too much power with a few people? Uh, that's a lot. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I'll just keep the giving pledge question aside and answer the first question, uh, which is about philanthropy and power. Uh, so, I mean, we heard this morning from the uh, board chair of uh, Imagine Canada that even in Canada, increasingly, giving has become the purview of people who are in the top well, who are very wealthy. I don't remember what, what, uh, what income category, but certainly the more wealthy. Uh, we also, as Callum presented, are hearing this trend from philanthropy for a desire to address root cause issues, to, to address things more strategically. So this brings me to, uh, to Rob Reich, who is a political philosopher at Stanford, who has basically claimed that big philanthropy, especially big philanthropy, is ultimately an exercise in power. It's about the wealthy using their private assets to affect public influence. And as a democratic society, as soon as the question of public influence comes up, I think we have to ask, or we have to confront rather, the question of power, right? So this plays out, uh, at least in my view, in three ways. Uh, the first uh, question of power has to do with wealth accumulation itself. So global North wealth, wealth accumulation is intertwined with histories of colonialism, of uh, racism, of slavery, uh, and of market capitalism that, yes, can sometimes be based on resource extraction, right? And that has resulted in, like, yes, wealth growth for the very rich, but has marginalized the, the, the uh, marginalized uh, uh, huge swaths of populations resulting in unprecedented inequality, right? So Oxfam puts out this report every year on uh, the state of inequality, and they just put out a report in January where they claim that the top 1% of the, of the wealthy in the world own as much wealth as 7 billion people. 
like our planet population, I think is seven and a half billion at the moment. So that's just a number to sit with, right? And about half uh, the people in the world uh, make only five dollars fifty US a day, right? So this is the world that we are living in. So as as soon as big philanthropy steps in to affect a public good, make a public influence, I think we have to ask ourselves, what is the reason behind doing that, and how is it changing our society? Right. The, the second way that this plays out has to do with the fact that big philanthropy essentially has a lot of freedom, a lot of leverage to influence society in, in, in the ways that they deem uh, make sense. Right. So as Callum was saying, people are giving for, uh, for causes related to religion, people are giving to health, people are giving to universities. Right. But it can, it can be much more insidious than that. Right. There are certain communities that are left out, particularly communities of color. Right, so if we look at the U.S. data, the uh, uh, the uh, uh, National Committee for Responsive Philanthropy uh, that does a study on how much money in the U.S. Get, gets moved to uh, people of color-led organizations, we find that it's under 10 percent. Right, it's around 8 percent, and has hovered that as much for for a long time. In fact, it's become worse over time. Right, uh, the the other way that this plays out is that. Uh, big, like institutional philanthropists, can stipulate uh, clauses within the giving that can essentially make institutional discrimination, systemic discrimination, worse. So, just an example in Canada has to do with the Leonard Foundation, which was established in the 1920s by Colonel Leonard, and it was uh, uh, an educational scholarship that was need-based, but. Within the clause of the foundation, it said that the scholarship should only be given to British subjects who are white and who are Protestant, right? And it was not until the 1980s that an Ontario Court of Appeal struck that clause out of the Leonard Foundation, right? So I'm not saying this is a trend, but I'm saying that there are sufficient examples for us to make us wary, to make us question that, hey, you know, we should be careful about these very powerful people with a lot of wealth trying to affect public change. And also, I mean, there's ample of literature on this. Essentially, when institutional funders enter into a relationship with nonprofit organizations, they essentially impose administrative and corporate structures on those nonprofit organizations. So this is, there is a history, uh, and most recently picked up by um, by Dr. Uh, uh, Erica Colarinas at, uh, at uh, one of the University of California systems, who talks about how the farm worker movement in the US, led by Cesar Chavez, essentially its edge was taken off as soon as they be became interested in labor organizing. The Ford Foundation, that was their biggest funder, became deeply uncomfortable with the idea of them supporting labor organizing and essentially imposed enough pressure on them that, that the farm worker movement had to change its direction altogether, right? Uh, and finally, I think that we have to also, and again, this is not something I've written. I think this has been picked up by Edgar Villanueva, who was mentioned by Callum, by Anand Girdharidas, who's written a, a book called Winner Takes All, which is a New York Times bestseller, by Lindsay McGuee, who's questioned the Gates Foundation and its philanthropic intent. But essentially, you know, we cannot disconnect the philanthropic activity of big donors with everything else that they do, right? That you cannot on one hand say, hey, I'm going to solve the social problem, but not pay attention to the fact that you may, your other actions in the business world or whatever might actually be exacerbating that social problem in the first place, right? So uh, for example, I mean, I'll just, I'll just say uh, an example that's been in the news recently, but the Sackler family, which owns Purdue, Purdue Pharmaceuticals that produces oxycodone, they're very respected in the philanthropic world. They've made huge grants to big arts institutions like the British Museum, the Louvre, the Guggenheim, as well as to universities, right? And right now, there are about 2,600, if I remember correctly, lawsuits pending against them for promoting the opioid crisis through the sales of oxycodone, right? So these two things, like you can't be a philo you can't greenwash your money, right? So this is just some ways in which I think the question of power plays out in big philanthropy. And what was Abigail Disney proposing? You were oh, sorry, that. yes, the giving pledge, yes. Uh, so, uh, you know, I don't have much to say about the giving pledge. It's been around since 2010, and the Chronicle of Philanthropy has done you know, a, a, a recent piece that's analyzed kind of its impact. Uh, so obviously, like, it, the pledge essentially, I think, has about 200 plus uh, 
very wealthy philanthropists from all over the world who have committed to part with half their wealth during their lifetimes. That's kind of the giving pledge, right? And Bill and Melinda Gates and, and Warren Buffett, I think, were the people who kind of organized uh, philanthropists around this. Uh, so, you know, on that, of course, it's, it's, it's much better to part with your wealth while you're living than not part with your wealth. So definitely a plus there, right? But uh, I think uh, people who have looked at this have, have examined whether, especially in the U.S., whether this has changed philanthropy in the, since 2010. And, and they found that philanthropy in the U.S. is still about 2% of people's annual income, right? So that's been more or less constant over this 10-year period. Uh, and also, um, uh, uh, you know, the, the other piece that's interesting, the Abigail Disney piece, is that there are some people within this network who have essentially gotten be behind Elizabeth Warren's uh, marginal tax for the very wealthy plan, uh, which include Abigail Disney and Nick Hanover, who are part of the Giving Pledge Network. And uh, they've essentially told the government, hey, just tax us more, right? Like, if you tax us by a marginal rate, uh, I think in Elizabeth Warren's plan, it's about 6%, that it can have a significant, make a significant difference in terms of public revenue that can then be allocated by essentially democratic means. You know, I mean, we might not be happy with government, but frankly, it's kind of the system we've got, and we've got to help make that more accountable to the people, uh, as opposed to private philanthropy, which also the other point I didn't raise is just accountable to its board, right? So the Gates Foundation, accountable to three people, right? Bill Gates, Melinda Gates, and Warren Buffett, who are the board members of the foundation. So it should worry us. It should worry us. Great. Thank you. Um, Chris, um, your organization does great work. I understand that you are a staff of two, as you've indicated. Uh, that is very lean. Um, so how do you survive and thrive with such a small staff? And also, when we were chatting earlier, you told me that when tiny teams do well, that can penalize you. So please elaborate. So I want to elaborate on that. And I also just want to say, uh, Fahad, I really appreciate your commentary about bringing um, the conversation of power into this conversation. Um, one of the things that, you know, that I was thinking about in these four kind of questions or solutions that was missing for me a, a lot of the day um, is a lack of analysis about power. And for me, I don't think we can have a conversation about the impact of philanthropy if we can't also talk about power. And power not just in terms of the amount of wealth that is accumulated somewhere, but also the power of who is making the decisions, who is deciding what impact matters, where is money being invested. Uh, but it also is about personal power. Uh, one of the things that we chatted about really quickly in the taxi over here is just how common it is, no matter where you go in the philanthropic sector in this country, people say things like, oh, well, I, I don't actually have that much power. Like, oh, I don't, I don't write the checks. I don't make the decision. It's the donors. It's my board. You know, we're not a Vancouver Foundation, so we can't play that game. You know, so what happens in the sector is people, the individuals in the sector, remove themselves, push themselves away from, and or deny the power and influence they have. The power and influence they have to educate donors who actually have silver bullet ideas that are completely harmful and shouldn't happen. You know, it becomes a responsibility of fundraisers to think about donor education differently. But it's also about folks who are doing fundraising and thinking about how they're going to tell stories, uh, thinking about investing in their boards and in their executive teams and how they're educating them to do their work of social location, to understand how power and privilege really influence all of this work that can happen. So I just, I appreciate that. I tend to feel a little bit like a broken record in the space bringing up those conversations. So just glad to have someone in that. Um, as you were saying, we, the, the Circle on Philanthropy is a, is a tiny but mighty team. So it's myself and another colleague, Shireen Munchi. Um, and we're a team of two. And so what's really interesting is I feel like our organization suffers in lots of ways because of the, the orthodoxies and the ideas that philanthropy has about things like overhead, for example. Um, and so my organization, which, which runs anywhere between $350,000 to $500,000 a year, um, you know, had for a long time a board that was really in the space of like, we don't need more than one or two two one or two people, but we do want to have a national impact on the philanthropic sector. 
Okay, good luck with that. How is that going to happen, right? So it's like it was really quite an interesting experiment to join the Circle on Philanthropy two and a half years ago and go, wait a second, you have a really beautiful desire to change the philanthropic sector. This organization was created by the philanthropic sector, so where's the money and where's the actual ability for change? So what has happened over the last couple of years is uh, Shireen and I have developed fantastic um, value for our members. We do amazing convening work. We're really excited to be the national hub on the Phylabs Research for Indigenous Philanthropy and, and the research related to um, that, and to build out our own research um, agenda, one that is led by indigenous worldviews related to generosity and giving and not by the traditional settler created philanthropic sector. All that to say, because we're so good at what we do with so little, it becomes very hard to convince people that we need more and that we could do better with more. It becomes especially concerning when the things that we're talking about, like power, like decentering whiteness, like understanding the ways in which our organizations are complicit in upholding white supremacy and how that causes harm to all of us. We're all swimming in that sea. We're all harmed by it. It means that it's very easy for my members and other organizations, a part of the philanthropic sector, to say, you're doing pretty good over there. You're, we don't want you to get too loud, not too powerful. Don't shake things up too much. So it has been a really interesting dynamic in the space that we're in right now. We're in a membership renewal um, that we've had to be very creative about how it is that we're talking to our members um, and how we're building a case for our work. So how we thrive after our first year together, I sat down with Shree and I was like, whew, that was a year. Uh, how about let's not do that again? Because it's just not sustainable. Like there's no way we could continue at this pace. And so, so one of the things that I did, given that in, in my worldview, my, my privilege to be connected to my land and my home territory, which is six hours north of here, uh, was to just slow down. And, and to sit with some questions related to how it is that humans relate to the land. And how, if we took the time to think about our relationship to the land, how we might be able to use those as lessons for the way that we do our work. And so our work is now based um, on a, our operational and our governance work plan is based on the seasons. Winter, spring, summer, fall. Most folks have some kind of affinity. Most people will tell you what their favorite season is fairly easily. And we use that as a way to both manage our energy, uh, but to communicate with folks an alternative worldview for our organizational structure and the way that we govern our organization. Winter for us is a time for the kind of laying the foundation and doing the administration work that makes an organization strong and healthy. So you don't always see the things that are happening under the snow, but work is happening. Springtime for us is about partnerships and emergence. It's about, you know, planting a thousand seeds and paying attention to what grows, but it's also about stewarding the, the emergence of new trends and opportunities that happen. Summertime is a season of member engagement. It's being out on the land, in ceremony, uh, it's hanging out in, um, in parks, in celebrations, and being with people while they're also sharing food. And fall for us is about knowledge mobilization. It's about tending to the harvest, paying attention to what it is that we've learned, how we can take what we've learned and make it um, valuable, not only for us internally, but for our members. If anyone here has ever grown a zucchini, you know that if you had more than one zucchini plant, you ended up with an abundance of zucchini, right? There's only so many times you can eat it. There are only so many times you can bring it to the office and someone will take it away. Eventually, you're like, what am I going to do with all this stuff? Make zucchini bread. You make zucchini bread. But one of the things that we talk about in our fall season is recognizing that sometimes you have to sit with things. So you might, you might can food and put it up. And you might leave it there for a season and go, oh, that knowledge that I've put away now has relevance in this new season. I'm going to enjoy um, the cabbage that is now sauerkraut in a different year. We're going to pay attention to the sweetness of these peaches in the middle of winter um, because there's an acknowledgement that we have to gather wisdom and information and recognize that there are different times and places to make use of it. So. Our, our tiny but mighty team has found deep nourishment and connection to one another, uh, but also to the, to the land that we're connected to, but also in inviting other people to be on that pathway with us. And she's in Ottawa and you're here, so is that hard? Um, I mean, she's, 
No, I'm, it's not hard in that she's really comfortable using a computer, which makes things easier for me. Uh, she answers lots of the questions I have, like I don't remember the password to get into Zoom, what is it? Um, and she doesn't roll her eyes too hard at me when I'm asking those questions all the time. We do a lot of video work, which is fantastic because I think it's also just better for the environment than flying around. Being able to work remotely for both of us means that, you know, if I'm visiting members in other places, I can hang out at a local community foundation or a public library or a local, um, you know, ethical coffee roaster and still get my work done and be in service to the folks that we're serving. Um, and I really believe in the value of working remotely. And, and nowadays, especially, um, it provides us with added like safety um, and the ability to just be out in community differently when we've got folks from all across um, Canada. That's great. Um, okay, Kevin, um, how does the foundation balance solving systemic problems versus providing band-aid solutions? For example, how much effort should be put into trying to alleviate the cause of homelessness versus getting people off the street and providing food, warmth, and shelters? Uh, Interesting to, to build off some of the earlier comments. One of the important ways of doing that is addressing power and decision-making processes. And for us, one of the key shifts in the last couple of years has been to put the people that are whose problems you're trying to address, support, uh, solve at the center of that process. Um, and Chris uh, used to work for us and really helped us understand in, in a particular area, in the case of foster care, of how important it was if you're looking at a system that at the time was supporting 8,000 kids across the province of whom 700 were aging out each year and many of those uh, young people were not achieving the levels of success that they wanted in their lives. They, whether it's education attainment or, or it's just all kinds of ways that we thought this system needs to generate better outcomes for young people in care and it was really when we put the people in in care and from care at the center of that process to identify what needed to be done, who needed to be an ally, who needed to respond, that we started to see progress. And it was a, a context of trying to do both things. It is absolutely essential that the, the rights of people are met, that their, their economic, social, cultural, political rights are met. So that, that basic needs work is foundational. It has to be met. Simultaneously, you can work on, on addressing the underlying causes, the root causes. And we've um, long recognized that we have a certain degree of power as an organization, I'll be the first to admit that. But we also uh, have some humility about that in terms of us vis-a-vis -vis the size of some of the systems we're working with and really trying to understand what's the lever that we're big enough to push. Uh, and so again, the foster care example, the, our province spends about $500 million a year on the foster care system. Sounds like a lot of money. And we were prepared to grant two or three million dollars a year to help address uh, better outcomes. So we recognized that we were not putting anywhere near enough money into the system to uh, change really the service levels. So we thought, let's ask the youth in care, the charities that support them, the representative for children and youth, the advocate, the people in the Ministry of Children and Family Development, the press, the politicians, to come together in a, a cohort and work with us to identify what kinds of things can we do that we're hearing from uh, people who are immediately affected in the system that will make their, make their outcomes better. And that uh, trying to run that balance of understanding where you have influence, where you have power, who actually has the ideas and how you're in service of those ideas are, are really important pieces. Uh, the last thing I would mention about um, uh, some of the things that we're seeing in the U.S. and I, I don't. Um, we pay a lot of attention to the the currents in the U.S. in terms of the the power of, of, of mega philanthropists of the, partly because it's it's relatively rare to see that replicated in Canada, and there are some things that I think we need to do to keep inoculating our system so that we have strong and robust dem democratic public policy systems that they're not um, necessarily easily captured or influences by single points of, of view. Uh, one of the big changes in our system was the limits on this is uh, some people talk about this as a double-edged sword is the limits on charities to be involved in political activities were changed substantially in 2018. We are still not allowed to do anything in the partisan way which I fully support but all charities in Canada all 86,000 of us now can without limit get involved in influencing public policy. That sounds dangerous but it's actually very democratic because it's, not as, it's just not just the one or two with resources, it's everybody. 
And we're encouraging charities to talk to their elected members of parliament, their municipal politicians, policymakers, to get involved in both of these things, ensuring there's enough resources to meet uh, basic needs and uh, put their weight and their ideas behind addressing the root causes. And often, root causes are, are dealt with through changes in public policy. That's great. Um, good to hear that you're doing that and encouraging donors uh, and uh, stakeholders to do that also. I'm, I'm going to jump in. Sure. I'm going to piggyback off of what um, Kevin was saying around fostering change because I think there's some added pieces there that are really valuable to add. So I was a manager in the fostering change work at Vancouver Foundation and I think there's lessons there for other folks who want to do social change work and public policy work. Yes, we did center the voices of young people in and from foster care but we also had people who are working in that space like myself and others who actually had experience as foster parents or who had been in foster care ourselves. Um, there was a deep investment in research and one of the big pieces of research was, a, was a, um, an economic test for, well, is, this isn't just the right thing to do to support kids up to 24, 25, but is there a financial case for it? And uh, lo and behold, the research said, not only is it a good thing to do, but there is now a financial case for it. And that investment in research then provided us with the ability to take the community building work that we had done and support them to recognize that they had an ability as a community, as the public parent of kids in foster care, to um, push on government to give them the social license to do the thing that is the right thing to do and the financially smart thing to do, uh, in addition to supporting through grants, through very wise and strategic and aspirational grant making, uh, multi-year investments. So it was a five-year project that started with a lens for how do you reduce youth homelessness to recognizing who is the, who is the population most at risk of experiencing homelessness, what other systems were they coming in contact with, and how you actually push those systems by using uh, the public as a lever for change. And I think what, you, what, what I discovered is that when you invite the public to recognize that they actually can do a little simple thing and it means that the lives of young people is changed because legislation, public policy, and financial investments are aligned to their values, uh, what you have is a commitment for change and investment in philanthropy and social good for the rest of their days. And I actually don't think there are enough people being creative about how to activate that in citizens today. Great. Well, thank you for that. Um, I'm going to ask just a couple of more questions and then I'm going to open it up to the audience. So just giving you a couple of minutes to think about some burning issue that uh, you might want to ask about. Um, I'm going to move to Jennifer. Uh, you're a successful and accomplished leader in the charitable sector. Um, yet you decided to do the MPNL, which is the Masters in Philanthropy and Nonprofit Leadership Program at Carleton. By the way, congratulations on your recent graduation. So why did you decide to take it uh, as a very seasoned leader? What aspects of the course had the biggest impact for you and why should others take it? So I think tonight sort of demonstrates one of the drivers I had to take the Masters in Philanthropy program. It's having deep, thoughtful, substantive, and diverse conversations about pressing issues that are facing us. So just tonight reminds me of why I joined the master's program and I had conversations like this throughout the two years of the program. There's uh, two of our graduates that were in my cohort. Here we are. So having deep substantive conversations like this is one of the reasons that I joined the master's program. There's two of our classmates here, Trina and Brad, that were in the program at the same time I was. And they presented a diversity of experience and thoughtfulness to the program um, that I could never have anticipated in any other venue. So Dr. Susan Phillips, who started the program, very intentionally wanted the cohorts to be a bouquet. She wanted this um, diverse group of folks to come together to study nonprofit leadership. So the whole class wasn't just old thorny roses like me. There were some fresh graduates that were there. Canada was represented, um, different ages. It was very inclusive as a diverse representation of the field. So that's the number one reason, is to have substantive and thoughtful conversations like we're having tonight. Second reason, um, something that I think increasingly troubled me as a practitioner, is the issue of the ethics of competence. There is a social and economic deficit facing Canadians, and there's also a leadership deficit in the nonprofit sector. So what we're seeing is 
folks taking positions of leadership um, that they're not trained to be in. So I saw the master's program as a way of demonstrating that the ethics of competence is vital for our field. We are guardians of the public trust. We are entrusted by Canadians to affect change. So we should be as effective and efficient as possible in leading that change. And I think that's our responsibility. And I think the masters equips us to be better leaders, frankly, and to be more efficient and to have a more positive return on investment um, for Canadians. So um, I, I would encourage anyone, and yes, this is a commercial now, <laughs> but you asked the question, Joanne, that wants to continue conversations like this and have a thoughtful, research-based, inclusive and diverse approach to philanthropy and nonprofit leadership, you can talk to me at the break um, or email me for more, but uh, the program far exceeded my expectations. And you did it while working full time in a very demanding job in a massive campaign. Mm -hmm. Congratulations. As did uh, our other classmates too. Incredible bouquet in this program. Thank you. So I have some more questions, but I'm going to pause. Uh, and I would like to uh, open it up to the audience. Uh, we do have, Rebecca has a microphone. So if you are going to ask a question, please uh, speak into it um, and hold it close. So do we have any questions uh, from the audience? Yes, over here. If there were a Canadian version of gift pledge, would it be any better? And I was puzzled by the final comment that it's that we should be concerned. And the second point was a phrase of a silver bullet that it can be harmful. So I just wanted examples of those. Um, well, well, I think I've got an answer for both things, and then I imagine you might have more to add as well. Um, so in so I don't know much about the giving pledge, but I do want to notify folks about something that is unique to here to Canada, which is connected to the Truth and Reconciliation Commission's call to action, which was the Philanthropic Communities Declaration. The Philanthropic Communities um, Call to Action, which was in response to the TRC calls to action, recognizing that the philanthropic sector was not identified as a key um, proponent in those 94 calls, the sector of folks got together and said, we recognize that although we are not named, we actually have some responsibility to activating on these 94 calls and making sure that they are, um, they are acted upon in this country and that our investments are moving uh, the dial on them. So the Circle on Philanthropy is the host of that philanthropic declaration, which was referenced earlier. Um, and we invite philanthropic institutions to sign on to that. What was, what's very interesting is it was created five years ago. There's about 75 or 80 organizations who've signed on to it. Uh, but very little to no investment has been made to actually um, understand the work that's been happening in that space. And so we're coming up on, on reactivating that declaration. It is the five-year anniversary this year. Uh, and we'll be asking our members to actually do more than to just sign the piece of paper, but to do things like do share data sharing so that they're talking about what is the amount of, um, what is the percentage of dollars they give to Indigenous-led organizations versus those with Indigenous beneficiaries. We'll be asking questions like how many Indigenous board members, staff, and grant adjudicators are in their organizations, as well as understanding how it is that they're investing locally in Indigenous-led solutions for change. Um, so I think that that's something that's worth knowing about. Uh, the other thing is that I think in the work that I've done and gotten to know through peers in the States is that the, the giving pledge is largely individual philanthropic efforts. It's like w you were talking about some of the concerns with individual high dollar net worth folks going like, I think I've got the answer on something. So when I talk about the silver bullet um, is it, what freaks me out about that is someone who says, I've got the single solution for this massive, complex social issue. Uh, I have red flags because it's just not possible. The complexity of the world that we live in actually requires more and more of us to exist in the place of, I don't know, but together we can figure it out. Um, and so when I come across donors who say, I've got the solution to kids who are in, in foster care, 
I'm usually not interested in having a conversation with them because they're they're probably got a solution that doesn't come from a place of lived experience um, and comes from a place that actually could do more harm than good. Um, and so silver bullets are harmful and I'm much more in the space of inviting people to convene around who else has solutions, who else has knowledge and lived experience, and how can we ensure that there's more voices around the tables to find solutions rather than just one. Yeah, and just to pick up on that second point, um, I think that uh, the the idea of co-creation is, is fundamental, right? So, I mean, there's a notion of community philanthropy that is also taking currency, and it's understood in different ways uh, in the sector. And one way to understand it, it is to center the community because grassroots actors, indigenous actors, you know, they understand the needs of their community best. And if you want to really commit to finding a long-term solution with the power and privilege and the resources that you have as a philanthropist is to sit down and co-think with them. It's not that help is not needed. I think you know there is a great deal that uh, people with power and privilege can do. Uh, and uh, to co-create and work in partnership is super, uh, super relevant and important. Uh, I don't have a whole lot to say on the giving pledge thing. Uh, I think there are Canadians on it, though I'm not, I haven't followed it very closely, to be honest. But maybe uh, maybe Kevin has more on that. I think there are maybe one or two Canadians have signed the pledge. It's a global uh, initiative. Anyone's welcome to sign it. But Canadians have been slower than Americans to take it up. Thank you. Uh, any other questions or comments that somebody would like to make? Uh, yes, over here. Hi. Um, one of the things that was missing in this uh, dialogue today was the role of volunteers and uh, whether or not, like the fact that volunteer was not mentioned in the impact, um, what the four solutions of the impact kind of concerned me. And so I just wanted to kind of get your thoughts on the role of volunteers and how they should or could be included in the solution. Yeah, for I, I'll, I'd like to jump on that one. Um, at Vancouver Foundation, we have about 150 volunteers that uh, support our work. We could not do our work without them, and nor would I want to. Uh, it's the kind of, as the volunteers are essential, they're the, they're the esprit of the organization, the core of what we do. Um, and so what we also talk about is we want to um, engage the time, ideas, money, and enthusiasm of citizens to build a better British Columbia. And that, um, that, that concept is really important, I think, to all generations of donors, that you can talk to them and, and accept and value any one of those four. And uh, one of the things that really was resonated with us on the work in, in foster care was one of the most important things that people could do was sign a petition to indicate to their to candidates in a municipal or in a provincial election that they wanted to see better outcomes for kids in care. And the fact that 17,000 people signed that petition, that they it was an incredibly uh, powerful statement. So with its volunteering, uh, signing petitions, we view them all as essential to uh, achieving our purpose. We tend as a sector to talk more about money than we should. Yeah. And that was a good question because um, philanthropy is giving time, treasure, and talent for the public good. So we tend to think of philanthropy of giving millions of dollars, um, giving your time is just as important, and it's not the size of the dollar amount that counts, it's giving in a way that reflects your values, making a long-term commitment to a cause, as opposed to just writing a check and forgetting about it. Um, it is there one more question? Don't forget the check. Yeah, I was gonna say, no, but I, I also still like it when someone just writes a check and gets out of the way. <laughs> Um, the other thing I'd say about philanthropy is that uh, I don't necessarily prescribe to some of the way that we talk about philanthropy in the, tonight. You know, in, as an Indigenous person, my worldview around philanthropy is one that I think is more holistic, that actually is multiple generations back with a heck of a lot more principles um, and practice about stewardship of resources. Um, and so I think that when we talk about philanthropy in, in this context, it's what I call settler-created philanthropy, which is the wealth that's been created on the lands and on the backs of Indigenous people and slavery. Um, and so what happens is when we, t when we have a conversation in that context, it, we, we remove ourselves from things like volunteers. We remove ourselves from the fact that people are giving of their, of their thinking time, of their wisdom, of their thoughtfulness, um, and, be, and we're 
far more centered on the dollars. And I do think that is problematic and just appreciate you for raising that. There's a question yeah, here. So thank you for raising that because my question was going to be related to it and I thought, okay, that's going way off where they want to be. But um, I think it's actually an opportunity. It's another branch. Right now, the philanthropy, you are talking about, you know, all, all the stats is around money. And uh, middle class is the one that contributes both, actually, uh, volunteer time. Plus, you know, on a small scale, we, we put in what we can. And uh, I work for the Government of Canada. We participate in United Way. So people are, one, giving in, at the higher levels, particularly uh, money for the tax write-off. And then all these other people are contributing time. And then they're buying things, and that's not a tax write-off. And, and so there could be... So I think... Um, it's like a tangent and something that Carlton could look at as you know, adding as another component into research. One, could volunteer time come back in uh, tax deductions? Because I'm going to work on this when I retire. And <laughs> two, um, sorry, just back to uh, what I said. Um, yeah, so now I've lost my thought, but. Um, the volunteer, and as well, um, just that, you know, looking at the middle class and their contribution. The other thing statement I use is, we're so used to saying time is money, but time is precious. So we put our time and we allocate it. So um, as a matter of fact, the work that we do through philanthropy is about now making change happen. And if we could show the second part the time you're looking for a result, and it has to be allocated effectively. A point you made about leadership. Um, in all leadership positions, oftentimes in any organization, people aren't qualified in those roles. They don't have emotional intelligence. So sometimes what you're going to see happen, I think a lot of people come forward, give their money with good intentions. But the actualization, and someone may say, oh, but also hire that person to do the job, and that person's not qualified, and it goes off tangent. And that high level, be it Bill Gates or whoever, they don't know how off the rails that stuff is going. So anyways, these are some of my perspectives, and I think uh, as a university that's pursuing these fields, there are areas of research where you can make impact. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so I'm gonna invite Callum to come up and back and, okay. and haunt you. Um, I have learned from the discussion, and I hope all of you have, had ideas introduced, um, and I, I guess in a sense thinking that to some extent philanthropy benefits from income inequality, and to some extent the power uh, that is of philanthropy is also the power that rests with that inequality. And yet what I've heard tonight is actually one in which there are people trying to manage with the power, perhaps challenge the power, and think fair enough to provide donors with agency, with a sense of what is important to them, but balancing it also with the power of, particularly the communities that are receiving that assistance, what is going to make the change that we all yearn for, and to draw that into the decision-making process that balances both the donor and the donee in, in some type of collective sense of what will actually help our society, and so that the intent of the donor is actually realized. What a challenge to manage. But the theme of power is something I'm really taking away from this, and one in which I think we can all think of how we can work with the power that we have, the resources we have, whether it's time, whether it's treasure, whether it's talent, how can we channel that to change the course of history that we leave to our descendants? And with that theme, I have immense gratitude to you for coming here and recognizing the importance of philanthropy. I have immense gratitude to the panel that has come. I have learned from you. I really have benefited from the diversity of views, but also the, the, the commonalities that I've been able to see. And really also very grateful to those people that allowed this to happen, uh, the anonymous donors, who have thought that having a national program also is a national responsibility, 
to hear from the different communities where our graduates from which they come to which they go back. We're so grateful that Vancouver was our first stop. I want to move here, but, uh, but it, oh, but those winters are also drab, so uh, you have to keep telling me that. Thank you. Thank you all. And uh, I invite you not to disappear, but to join us here with a bit of refreshment. Don't disappear. Please introduce yourselves to us and to someone you don't know. But uh, again, thank you, and let's, let's give our, our panelists uh, a round of our appreciation. Thank you. We are all here for good. There you go. Good night.